They're coming, they're coming, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and a welcome. Welcome to a special evening at my own. I want to take this. I want to take this opportunity to wish everybody a good Geben Shtiar and a Gemar Chasim Atoiva. May this be your best year ever. So much bracha, so much light, so much. Right now, right now. Thank you. So thank you for joining us tonight. I want to thank uh, all of you for coming. I'd like to thank uh, the rabbis that are here already, the rabbis that will be here soon for uh, sharing. This is very, very high, intense time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, especially for rabbis with all that goes on, shul obligations. So it's very special for um, them to come here. And we also want to thank the sponsor of today's evening, um, Sam, the Samuel Horowitz uh, and Manya Horowitz uh, Charitable Trust. This is a, was a uh, special, special sponsorship. I want to thank Frank Lee for always arranging this for us and uh, Shem Shem Ben Shem and his family. And this should be Lezecha Nishmas for them. Uh, for the heart, uh, Samuel Harwit and Manya Harwit. I don't know their names, but I'm sure Hashem knows who we're talking about. May this be his chus for their neshamas. And um, we have over here today, the, the today's topic, uh, we're seeking to come to Yom Kippur feeling really strong. Feeling strong, healthy, and um, come into Yom Kippur the simcha, the joy. Um, we don't need the anxiety. We have so much stress and, uh, and um, things hitting, hitting us from all directions. Our Yiddishkeit and our connection to Hashem should be uh, exil. Should be with, should really be the simcha. If there was Hashem, the simcha. Sometimes hard to be able to tap that. And that's what we're trying to do here tonight. To get all kinds of perspectives on um, moving beyond. I mean, there is an element of, 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 of holy and positive dread. There is a dread, but it's, it's more of an awe than a dread. And um, it's the right attitude. But at the same time, the inner fire in our soul has to be, we should be really excited to come to Shul to Yom Kippur. And really, really... Um, motivated and that's what we're here tonight so first we have the honor of having rabbi yisrael majeski uh he runs a kolal in the valley and he has a shul kuhulas left simcha of the valley uh you've seen him probably on videos he's a huge inspiration to yidden across the entire world uh he's got a fantastic energy and an unbelievable outlook couldn't have been a better person to present first tonight to bring us a very healthy perspective, an uplifting perspective on Yom Kippur. Thank you, Rabbi Majeski. Okay, thank you so much, Rabbi Wolf. Um, thank you for having me here. They used to say on the fan, WFAN, first time, long time. Yeah, long time. Uh, I've been uh, dreaming of this moment to get to speak in my yan. Thank you so much. So they say over that there was a. Uh, this Breslov or Chassid, and he had to spend some time in Gehenna. And it's really hot down there, and he's screaming out, Rebbe, Nana, Nachman, Yuman, Rebbe, Rebbe. And he comes down, the Rebbe says, what are you doing here? 
says, no, I ended up here. He says, you want to leave? He says, yeah. He says, come. He sticks out his hand. Chassid grabs on. He pulls him out. This Lubavitch guy sees this going on. He's like, that was cool. Rebbe, Rebbe. Rebbe comes down. He sees this chassid there. He says, what are you doing here? I don't know. I was out of town. And I guess some things along the way. He said, you want to leave? Yeah. It's so hot. I need to go. And then there was this Litzbach. Litzbach sees what's going on. He calls out to his Rebbe. He's mashkiach. Mashkiach, mashkiach. And mashkiach comes down. He looks at him. It's burning. It's fiery. It's fierce. Mashkiach looks at him and says, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you this will happen? <laughs> now you see. So I guess you need one Litvak over here in this lineup to tell you really about Yom Kippur. <laughs> they, they called him Majeski. So there's a, there's a lot of things going on these days. I don't know what you would call them. Maybe rituals. There's a halacha, Shulchan Aruch. Tough reish. Hey, mashinoyagim lasais kapara beriyom ekipurim lishchay tarnagol. Al kol ben zachar veloymar lo psukum yesh limnoya haminhag. Mechaber says that maybe we should stay away from this minhag, from this custom to you kaparis. And the Mishnah Rub brings down because some would say it's darchiha emoiri. It's the ways of like the Gayim to be slaughtering things and saying things. And the Ramah brings down we should do it. But if you look really throughout these throughout these days, there's a lot of minhagim. Then hug them on what to eat. We eat types of food, kreplach, they're covered up, the meat. So we want to like cover our virus. We eat honey the whole time. Things should be sweet. We don't need any nuts. Chas v'shalom. Geizim are gematria chet. As my Rebbe used to say, chet is also gematria chet. But we don't want to eat any nuts. We eat simonim, different types of simonim, everything to go. I have this the greatest year. We put on this beautiful white kittel. Whoever remembered to wash their kittel from Pesach, it's still white. Everyone else, you see, come again, you can tell how their shalom bias is going. And then, of course, we have tashlach. Raise your hands if you did Tashlach already. Okay. We have the minute to do it a minute before Shmi Yatzeris. It's, it's the Majeski Minog. And, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I was looking at a lot of these men hug him on what we do and eat. And, you know, you always have some and hug him on different Yom Tovim. But now, this time of year, it just seems like there's a lot. We are called the Am Segula, the nation of Segulas. But as someone once came to, to, to the Rav, there's a woman who said, I need a Segula, I need a Skula, and the Rav gave her a button. She said, Rabbi, what is the Skula for this button? I said, you should put it right over here. Sew it on well. A segula is meant to accomplish something, to really have a change. Or Moshe Shapiro asks, he asks it on Tashlich, but the truth is the question could be asked on many of these things which we're doing. He asks, you know, when we go to Tashlich and we say that we're going to want to throw our averas from Metzulah's yam, he says, what is really going on? You know what it, you know what it really means to do tshuva? Open up a Rambam Hilchas tshuva. Open up a Rabbeinu Yoyna Shari tshuva. And you'll look at the steps of tshuva. It's not so simple. Sorry, I said you're burning the litvak. 
There's charata, kabbalala asid. There's vidoy. There's things to do. There's this is serious stuff. The achits are not just some song. This is real. To think, to reflect, to comp- contemplate, to change, to understand who we are. And here we go, we're eating kreplach and kaparis and throwing the tashlich. What are these rituals? Rabbi Revach from Pico said over an amazing Shemi Shmuel. I heard this over for Rabbi Minder who spoke uh, in the valley on Rosh Hashanah, Beisvila. beautiful Shemi Shmuel. The Shemi Shmuel says that we, we keep on saying the Yud Gimel Midas Harachamim over and over again throughout these days. Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum V'chanon, Erech HaPayim, Rav Chesav Emes, the 13 attributes of Hashem to evoke the Midas Harachamim. But there's one word in there that seems a little bit out of place. That is the word emes. Kel rachum v'chanan. That's great. Erech apayim. Flow to anger. Rav chesed. Beautiful. They say avon. You remove avon. Emes. Emes truth. Who wants truth? Can't handle the truth. I can see the three people that didn't laugh, Baruch Hashem, and Padosh Vitar. Who wants MS? Why are we saying MS in here? Reminds me of the guy who goes to his rabbi. He says, Rabbi, I have a court case coming up. I don't know what to do. They want to sue me and the government and the state, and everyone's coming after me. He says, Davdavan, and he says, I need a bracha. Rebbe says, okay, I give you a bracha. The MS, the truth should come out. He says, Rebbe Chas Shalom. Please don't say that. Why are we asking for MS? Zak to Shemi Shmuel. What we're asking for MS is we're asking the Abishter to look at us. And see who we really are. See the real Emmas. Look past, look past the Tithus and the Klepus and the Yetzaharas. Look underneath it all. Look at the Emmas of who I really am. Zakhar of Moshe. Zakhar of Moshe Shapiro, you know what happens when you go to Tashlach? When a Yid goes to Tashlach, That yid is stating a, a fact. That yid is stating a truth. And the truth is that this Avera which I did, I can throw away very easily. It almost is a ritual. What's the difference between a bar mitzvah and a bal Avera? How come when you do, when somebody comes 13, we call him a bar mitzvah? And when someone does an Avera, we call him a Baal Avera. Says Rabbi Moshe, your father is going to be your father for life. No matter where you are, no matter what you're wearing, no matter what you're doing, you are a son. You can identify as a giraffe. You can say you are whatever, you are a son to your father and mother. But a Baal, an owner, an owner can decide to sell. An owner can make Hefker, can get rid of, can nullify. An owner can give away a present. A Balavera is called a Balavera because it's not you. You own it. You have to get rid of it. But precisely for that reason, it's called a Balavera because that's not who you are. And how many times do we associate ourselves with the sins that which we do? 
I am an angry person. I am sad. I'm someone who can't learn. I don't go to shul. I never call my mother, said every child. You never call me, said every mother. I don't do this. I don't. And we become one almost with the, with the sin. So every one of us has struggles, demons, addictions, midas raos, depending on where, where you are. You can use whichever word you'd like. And I have many of those. A good friend of mine told me that uh, he used to think he was the nicest guy in the world, and then he got married. The women are like, what, what happened after marriage? A lot. And uh, we, get to, we get to know ourselves. So I, I, I have, I have this, this, uh, this bad habit. I like to sleep late. And, you know, I was able to deal with it as a bacher, and I got married, and, you know, you manage. And then I moved back to LA, and I had my first job. And I really had to wake up on time. So uh, my wife, you know, basically inherited the, the role of Becker. And after a certain point, rightfully so, she said, okay, Yisrael, it's time. She says, you got to get yourself out of bed. I'm like, no. So she bought me this alarm clock. And this wasn't stop an alarm clock. She, she Googled loudest alarm clock in the world. And there is such a thing. It's called the sonic boom alarm clock. As I state, this thing comes with a wire that goes on your bed. And your bed shakes when the alarm goes off. And this alarm sounds like you have like a fire alarm in your house. Okay. So my wife gets me this beautifully wrapped present. <laughs> it's great. It's like the equivalent of buying your wife a scale, you know? Anyway, so see me for other shalom bias. And, I, and th th I get this alarm clock. And the first time we use this, was was on the Shabbos Kaidish. Now, most alarms I, I, I grew up with, after 10 minutes, even the alarm clock gives up. There may I like everything stops. Even the, the seatbelt in your car, three, four minutes, it gives up, right? I, I timed it. Everything stops, but no, not the sonic boom alarm. This thing just kept on going. Now, I truth be told, the sonic boom alarm clock did not wake me up. I was very proud of that. I woke up for my kids banging on the door. <laughs> this thing was so loud. They woke up the entire house. So now we have this Shabbos afternoon suda, and, and there's a fire truck in my house. So I told all my kids, I said, go find every towel that we can find. And every kid comes back with like five towels, and we start covering this alarm clock. I'm standing on the bed, we're out of towels, and it's still going. I said, blankets. As everyone start bringing everything comes, and we built this like Mount Everest all the way to the ceiling. And the alarm clock was like this little sound. Very subtle. And after Shabbos, we made Abdullah, we went to my room. And my kids wanted to take off the whole, the whole thing. I said, no, not so fast. Let's do it one at a time. I want to hear when does it start getting loud? On each towel coming off. Each blanket, you heard it louder and louder and louder until it was booming. What happened to the sound the whole shop? Sound was there. The sound was there, but it was covered up. Here we get Yidden. And the shamas have a lot of towels covering them. Every Avera, every Rechuk. It's another layer over that neshama. But there's once a year where we get to pull those towels off. There's a time period in the year we go to some chickens and we say, 
I'm throwing away my Averis because this is not me. Towel off. I'm not eating these nuts that are gematria because that's not me. I'm wearing a kittel because that's me. These aren't just segulas. This is showing us who we really are. Like the Lubaba Chereva, the Sadi Vakadish Lavracha said, I can quote him here safely. Lubaba Chereva said, Why did Hashem work out Esav and, and, and Yaakov with the brachas, the whole trick of Rui? Couldn't it just have him come get a normal bracha? You know, the whole thing. Zakhtar Rebbe, because David Shtun knew that there's going to be many, many, many Yaakovs coming along who look like Esau's. We're going to need that bracha. And I don't think it's the people out there who are the Yaakovs dressed like Esau. Sometimes it's the people in here. The way we view ourselves. Do we have that, that cook, that correct outlook of who we really are? Because Rabbeinu Yaina tells us when we realize who we are, we act that way. Princes don't play in the mud. Princesses get dressed like a princess. Who are we? I was one time dominating here in, in Chabad. Came in from the city. I woke up for Vasik in that. No, it was like a 10:30 minute. And as I'm walking out, there was this uh, elderly man. He looked like he was in his 80s, 85. He was wearing a fanny pack. And he was putting away his tefillin. And he asked me, "Can you help me? Can you help me put away my tefillin?" It wasn't going. I was on my way out. I was supposed to go straight to the the bakery to get my donuts for my kids. And as I'm going out, he's like, oh, can you help me? I'm like, ah, oh, if you missed that 10 o'clock you know, window, you're done. Those crumb donuts are gone. Buttermilk for sure. So I said, yeah, okay, yeah, why not? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna help you wrap your film. I come, and as I'm wrapping his film, I realize he put the shalyan and the shalrash, shalrash, I was all mixed up. I take it out, I start wrapping it up. And as I'm doing this, he gets a phone call. He had one of these old StarTech flip phones. And he picks up the phone, and I'm wrapping it, and this is the way the conversation goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, four million. Four million here. Six million to this person. Two million. I'm like, either he's talking Monopoly money, or this guy is like, what is going on? Okay, and once again, if you put three million dollars here, and keep it millions and millions, I, I keep on unraveling this fill and wrapping it again. <laughs> This is like the, the longest film rap in history. This, he was on for 15 minutes, and it was, that film was tough. You know, it was a, so he finishes, he finishes this, this phone call, and he says, do you want to know who that was? Yes. <laughs> he says, that was my lawyer. They keep on messing up with my will. Like, you want to see my will? I'm like, Yes. <laughs> I never got asked before, do you want to see my will? That was, this was very exciting. He takes out of his pocket this paper, he unfolds it, and he shows me his will. This yid was from Chicago, and he has written out where he's giving all his money. I look at him. I said, the shul in the valley. <laughs> I'm looking to build my house. You want to go out for coffee? Let's get to know each other. I had so much time, Rabbi Isai. The donuts could wait. What happened? What was the difference between an old man asking me to help us fill in and all of a sudden I'm talking to him for an hour? What changed? Rhetorical question. $15 million changed. But imagine if that's how we see every year. 
Imagine if that's how we see ourselves. In the proper light, the way that we really should. That's what Yom Kippur is about. It is serious. True of a serious business. To really look at who we are is it's not easy. It's not a gimmick. But we really have to know who we are to look at who we are. I want to end with this. I got a phone call from a Talmud right after Rosh Hashanah from Sibgedalia. He's in Eretz Yisrael. He said, Rebbe, I have to tell you something. He said, you know that there's this Segula to stay up the whole night, Rosh Hashanah, and finish the hill in two times. Everyone's talking about it. I said, yeah. He said, I did it. After my Suda, I said the entire Tehillim two times. And I'm not, a, I'm not a fast reader. You know that, Rebbe. I was up till 5.30 in the morning. And then you could ask about Kasha. You could ask something from Hashem. He said, Rebbe, do you want to know what I asked for? I said, no, that's between you and Hashem. You know, I really wanted to know. I was hoping he was going to ask me again. Like you go to someone's house, you want something to eat? No, 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 please ask me again. I was like, one of those. He says, Rebbe, you really don't want to know? I said, okay. You got me. Everybody say, open up your hearts. This boy stayed up till 5.30 in the morning. He finished the hill him twice. You can ask any about Kasha for Hashem. You know what he asked for? Says Hashem, please help me with my Shemir Sinayim this year. Help me watch my eyes. Ebishter. That's who we are. That's who we are when all the towels come off the alarm clock. That's what we're made of. We can't get confused by what we do. So, Bazras Hashem, as we go through this amazing day of Yom Kippur, we're going to ask for tshuva, and we're going to be honest with ourselves of we were holding and what we did, and how we want to get better, and what steps we're going to take. Most important message that we have to understand is. I'm the Shema Chilakali Kami Mal. That's who I am. Everything else is a costume, is a mirage. And once I realize that, and once I internalize that, and once I know that with clarity, I'll be able to make all the steps of Shuva that I need to make. We should be Zaycha, like Mark Stephen Taib in a good convention. We gotta wonder, we gotta wonder what happened with the old time Litvax. The Litvax became Hasidim. Look at that. <laughs> so thank you, Rabbi Majeski. I knew I knew he has it in him. I knew I just came here to bring out the I you know, I wanted Rabbi Majeski to shed publicly. Perfect. Thank you. Can we have the honor? Uh, I'm having with us Rabbi Kalman Top. I reached out to him about, I think, seven, eight years ago to come here. <laughs> it's an event, and it took seven years, but Baruch Hashem, there he is, uh, the rabbi of Beth Jacob, big shul on Olympic Boulevard. We all go and we wait on traffic, right? Coming back here on carpool. We're always sitting in front of Beth Jacob. Here's the rabbi. <laughs> in any case, Baruch Hashem, he's with us, and I'm sure he'll have something special for us to hear. You can just put this on. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Rabbi Wolf, for inviting me uh, seven, eight years ago and for inviting me a couple of times and hopefully 
Um, it's, it's really great to be here uh, together with all of you. And uh, thank you for joining. So a man came to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, I need your help in doing tshuva for a sin that I committed. And the rabbi said, sure, you know, I'm happy to help you. It's in the season of tshuva and forgiveness. And the man said, well, uh, what I did was uh, that is that I ate bread without washing my hands. And the rabbi said, okay, that's, uh, you know, you're supposed to wash your hands before you have bread, but it's not such a terrible sin. Uh, and I'm happy to help you do tshuva for that. But tell me, uh, why did you have bread without doing the til sedayim? So the man said, well, the reason is because I was eating in a non-kosher restaurant. And there was no washing stations and the bathroom was occupied. And so that's why I had to have the bread without uh, washing my hands. And the rabbi says, oh, so you were in a non-kosher restaurant. That's a little bit different. But tell me, there's so many kosher restaurants in Los Angeles. Why in the world were you at a non-kosher restaurant? The man said, rabbi, I have to admit, well, all the kosher restaurants were closed. It was Yom Kippur. So the good news is that uh, most of you, my guess is all of you, uh, will not be eating on Yom Kippur, so you're ahead of the game. And also, it's uh, really special that you're not just uh, rolling into Yom Kippur, but you're, uh, you, you took time after a busy day with so many things going on to study Torah, to think about the growth and to connect with one another. And uh, Rabbi Majeski, that was a, 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 that was a, a great um, presentation, wonderful remarks, and much funnier than I'm going to be. So it's, uh, it was enjoyable listening to you. Uh, but I'm also reminded of the of the rabbi who was, uh, you know, people were uh, leaving the shul on Rosh Hashanah, and the rabbi was uh, wishing uh, Shana Tova to each of them, Gidyantif. And then uh, Mark, the teenager, comes along, and the rabbi says, Mark, now is the time for you to join the army of God. Mark says, I'm already in the army of God, rabbi. The rabbi says, well, Mark, then why do I only see you on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur? I don't see you any any other times. Mark says, well, Rabbi, I guess I'm in the secret service. <laughs> and uh, I'm talking here to Jews here. You don't just come on Rosh Hashanah. You don't just come on Yom Kippur. You're here on a weeknight. And my guess is you come over the course of the year to the shul. So again, uh, you have already a lot to feel good about and to be proud of. And But Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is a very serious day. It's a fast day. It's a sacred day of teshuva. But it's also a very happy day. Uh, the Mishnah Tana says that Lo Yomim Tovim Li Yisrael. Rav Shimon Gamaliel says that there were no happier days on the whole calendar than Tuba'av and Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is one of the happiest days of the year. And the Gemara explains the reason is because on Yom Kippur we receive the second Luchot and a message of forgiveness for B'nai Yisrael for the golden calf, but also it became a day of Teshuva and Slich and Kapara for all of us for anything wrong that we might have done over the course of the year, eating bread without washing our hands, whatever it might, whatever it might be. But even though it is a day of Simcha, uh, it is a serious day of trepidation. We know that we don't say Hallel on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur because it's, these are days of judgment. The books of life and death are open in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And we know that the judgment is written on Rosh Hashanah and it's sealed on Yom Kippur. So it's a day of trepidation. It's a day that's, uh, that's it's a serious, sacred day. And so I, I think what Rabbi Wolf asked me to speak about is to give you chizuk. And I started with those jokes to give you chizuk. You're, you're going to be fasting on Yom Kippur. You're not just in the secret service. You're, you're the Na if you're coming here in the middle of the week, my guess is you're part of the Navy SEALs and the commandos of Am Yisrael. And, but the question is, with the serious nature of the day, so how can we reach that level of simcha that Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel speaks about? How do we reach that sense of, uh, of confidence and excitement and enthusiasm in ourselves, in the life that we're leading, so that we can be confident that we're going to receive kapara from Hashem and a shana tova, gemar chasima tova for the upcoming year? You'll notice that in the, in the Shmona Esrays, every single Shmona Esray from Rosh Hashanah until Yom Kippur. So we have insertions that we add to the, that we add to the Shmon Esrei. Um, and I noticed quite a number of years ago that there's a progression that occurs. Perhaps you notice it as well, because of course we all have Kavana when we're davening and think about all the words that we're saying. So one person once told me that 
you know, that bef- uh, before you daven, you should really say it's Fila Saderich, and after you daven, you should say Birchas Agomel, because we travel all over the world uh, during the course of the Shwan Esrei. But again, I'm speaking to but I'm speaking to Navy SEALs and commandos here. So my guess is perhaps you do have kavana in the Shvan Esrei. So the first insertion that we have is Zachreinu Lechayim, Melech Hafez Bechayim. The second insertion is Mikamocha Avarachamim Zocher Yisur of Lechayim Barachamim, right? Who is like you, who gives us life with mercy. Uh, the third insertion that we have is in the penultimate bracha. And we say, right? You should inscribe us for good life. And then the last one, we say, And we have a whole paragraph. And I noticed that, perhaps you noticed this as well, that there's a progression that occurs over the course of these insertions of the Shemon Esra. That in the first one, what do we just ask for? Bless us for chayim, for life. In the second insertion, we say, no, it, should, it shouldn't just be Chaim. It should, it should be Chaim Barachamim. Chaim with a shtickel mercy. The third insertion, we say, we don't just want Chaim or Chaim Barachamim, but we want it to be Chaim Tov. It should be a good life. But then in the last insertion, we realize as believing Jews, right, everything is Latov. That's why we don't just say Shana Tova, but of course, that's fine to say Shana Tova. But we say Shana Tova Umetuka because we don't just want it to be good. Everything is for the good. Everything is for the good. So we want it, but we want this year to be a sweet good. We want it to be a revealed good. We want it to be an obvious good. So that's how we end. We say not just a Chaim, not just a Chaim Barachim, not just a Chaim Tovim, but it should be a Chaim. We throw in the whole kitchen sink, a sink in the last um, uh, insertion. And we say, we say for Chaim. Bracha v'shalom u'parnasetova should be a blessing of peace, of prosperity for all the nation of Israel. And the question I had is, the next question I had on this is, which, okay, so there's interesting progression, but so what is it that gives us the capacity during the course of the Shemon Esrei to keep asking for more and more? And I guess the reason is because we're gaining momentum. We gain spiritual momentum. Over the course of the Aseris Yimei Tshuva and over the course of, let's say, a Shabbat and the Shalash Shuddis, we're kind of feeling that energy from the course of Shabbat and over the course of the Aseris Yimei Tshuva. But what really gives us that koach to ask for more and more over the course of the Amidah? And I want to leave that as, the, as the, like my first um, question, or like as my first question is, how do we achieve Simcha Yom Kippur? And okay, we'll call this the second question, which is, what is it that gives us the ability to ask for more and more? over the course of the Shemon Esrei. The third question I'll ask is that in the Rosh Hashanah davening, so one of the things that we say is, uh, and it's, a, it's the debate between Rabbi Laz and Rabbi Shua. Rabbi Laz says that the world was created in Tishrei. Rabbi Shua says the world was created in Nisan. But I would say the general position, the consensus is perhaps like Rabbi Eliezer, that the world was created in Tishrei. And we say in the, in the Shemon Esrei of Rosh Hashanah, and the Ramban says, you see from here that we pass like Rabbi Eliezer, we say, hayom This is the beginning of your works. However, the Medr says that really uh, the world didn't begin to be created on Aleph Tishrei, but really that was the day that mankind was created. That's the anniversary of the Sixth day of creation. Okay, I'm just reminded of the, uh, you know, of the of the young girl who turns to her mother and says, you know, originally where where did where did people come from? The mother says, well, God created Adam and Chava, and they had children. And then she went to the next day to her father and said, where do people come from? And he said, well, over millions of years, monkeys evolved into human beings. The girl is uh, utterly confused. She goes to the goes back to her mother and says, I don't understand. You said that God created human beings. And the dad, Abba, says that uh, human beings evolved and we came from monkeys. So the mother thought for a second and said, well, well, it's very simple. I told you about my side of the family. Dad told you about his. So on Rosh Hashanah, we're really celebrating the mother's side of the family. And we're asking big questions. And, but it's the anniversary not of the creation of the world. According to the Medrash, it's the, it's the anniversary of 
mankind, the creation of mankind. When we gained and lost Gan Eden, and uh, creation, okay. So the question, therefore, is, this is my next question, how do we describe this as the beginning of God's creation when there was five days of creation prior to the creation of human beings? So why do we say this is the day of the beginning of your works and the beginning of your creations when really it's the anniversary of mankind, not the anniversary of the beginning of creation? And my last question is that one of the central activities that we do over the course of Yom Kippur is we say vidui. We do a total of, we actually have five tefillot, five tefillot on Yom Kippur, parallel to the five tefillot, immersions in the mikvah of the Kohen Gadol. Uh, because we don't have a Kohen Gadol, but every person is serving our Kaddish Baruch Hu and trying to reenact that and connect with that. And so we don't have the five emergence of mikvah, but we have the five prayers, right? We have uh, Mariv, Shachrit, Musaf, Mincha, and Ne'ilah. And we have the 10, we have 10 different viduyim, 10 different confessionals, right? We're trying to, right? We're trying to wake up, we're trying to wake up the heart, trying to get our heart going again, to try to feel a little bit more, to connect with other people, to connect with our Kaddish Baruch Hu. And we sing, right? We say, Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu. We sinned, we stole, we betrayed. Why are we singing when we're talking about the sins? So one of the Hasidic masters said, because I think it was or Levi Yitzhak said, because we're fulfilling the mitzvah, a mitzvah of teshuva. And we're besimcha when we're fulfilling this mitzvah. But we do 10 viduyim over the course of uh, Yom Kippur. In the Ila, it's just a short, a short viduyim. Uh, but we do one in the silent Amidah, and then we do one in the Chazarat Ashats for each of the five prayers. And I would like to suggest that the 10, 10 viduyim are parallel to the 10 washings of the hands and feet that the Kohen Gadol did over the course. He did it right before he got dressed, and after he uh, you know, would change out of his clothing, he would change five times. And so we're also trying to wash our hands and feet over the course of Yom Kippur by saying the vidui. That's the classic form of confessional that we do. And of course, that's a key component of tshuva to talk it out, to articulate it. And, but the Chazal also called something else vidui. Uh, we read about it a couple of weeks ago. And it's uh, something that it's called vidui meiser. Not sure if you've heard about it, um, but it it's actually appears in Parshat Kitavo right after the Bikurim. And Chazal call it a vidui. And if it's called a vidui confessional, we would expect it to be the farmer, right? The farmer is coming and he's bringing his Bikurim, he's bringing his Maiser. Uh, he brings in the first year, in the second year, third year, and he brings all the different tithes to the, to the Kohen, to the Levi, to the poor person. And if it's called a vidui, so we would have expected it to be something where he's uh, falling short where he's making mistakes, where he's not giving the 10% or whatever the amount is. But if you look there, what the farmer says is basically that I did everything right. I didn't violate a single mitzvah. I didn't forget anything. I didn't forget to make a bracha, Rashi says. So what kind of vidui is that? Now you could say that any person who thinks that she or he is perfect so that's already a problem because nobody is perfect, although all of you, I'm sure, are very, very close, but I'm not perfect. Um, and that's my last question. Okay, you got the, the four questions. It's not Pesach night, but it's, uh, right? So the first question is, how do we achieve Simcha and Yom Kippur if it's such a serious day? Second question is, what gives us the capacity to ask for more and more over the course of the Shemona Esrei, not just for Chayim, but Chayim Barachamim, etc.? Uh, the third question is, Third question is, how do we describe Rosh Hashanah as the beginning of God's creation? If indeed Rosh Hashanah is, when we start talking about the mother side of the family, it's the, it's, it's the anniversary of creation of mankind. And the last question is, why do we, why do Chazal, in a number of places, they call it Vidui Meiser. Why do they call it Vidui if it's the opposite of Vidui? The farmer is not confessing anything, but actually he's saying that he did everything perfectly. So, not sure which one to answer first, but um, let's look at the insertions. Rishon, Rishon. 
in the, the first insertion we say is Achreinu, remember us. Remember us. We're like anonymous. In the second insertion, we don't just say Zachreinu, we say Micha Mocha Avrachamim, Zocher Yitzurav Lechaim Barachim. Ah, we're not just anonymous. We're creatures created by Hashem, which already gives us some level of significance. In the third insertion, we say Uchtov Lechaim Tovim. Right? We, we always get up to it, waiting, the chazan's waiting, the chazan forgets, right? We realize we have a covenant and a relationship with Hashem that goes all the way back to Avram Avinu. And then in the last one, we finally identify who we are and we recognize what our, what our status is and what our identity really is. And we realize that what? The Sefer Chaim Baruch HaVashon Panos HaTov and Yizoch V'Kosach V'Necha Anachnu with the Jewish people. We have a Mi Amcha Yisrael Gayachad Baretz, right? That one said we live in the Mi generation. Mi Amcha Yisrael Gayachad Baretz. The amazing people that we have and the Torah and Mitzvos that we have and that connection with our Kodesh Baruch Hu. That's what gives us the ability to ask for more and more over the course of the Shmon Esrei because we're building that relationship over the course of the Shmon Esrei and over the course of the Eser Simei and throughout our lives. And as we build that relationship, so we realize that Hashem is not just Malkenu, not just the king, but he's also Avinu, Avinu Malkenu being one of the anthems of the, of the Eser Simei And as we grow in terms of who we are, and we realize, wow, I'm not just anonymous, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a human being, and I have a covenant. Oh, and I'm part of the nation of Israel. So we, we realize our level and the greatness that we have. We realize that, wait a second, we're a case in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the Aser Simei Tshuva. That means we're not irrelevant. That means what we do makes a difference. And, and so therefore, that's what gives me the ability to ask for more and more as I build that relationship and I realize who I am. And the greater we realize that who we are, that we're each of you in your own way have, have talents and abilities and resources. Each of you has a, has a purpose and mission in life that you are in the course of achieving. And as we realize over the course of the Shema Nesri, who we are, that's what gives us the ability to ask for more. What's the second question? How do we describe it, right? How do we describe it as, well, or that was the second question. Okay. Well, what's the, the third? We'll come back to the first question. Um, what, was the, what was the other question we said? How do we describe it as the anniversary of creation, right? If indeed it's day six. The answer is that the entire world was created for you. Yes, I know Chiyafar Ve'efer, I'm dust and ashes, but the Shvili Nivra Olam, the world and all its vast resources were created for human beings, were created for you. Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of creation. And on your birthday, everyone here, you celebrate your birthday. That's the day, and Rosh Hashanah is the birthday for everyone. That's the day that HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided, right, that you have a purpose in this world. That you are needed in this world to accomplish something. And so, before human beings were created, before we were created, so the entire world, with all, with all its vast resources, with all its stunning scenery, Yosemite and Yellowstone and all the different parks, is meaningless. It, so we're the, and that's why we say that Rosh Hashanah, which is the anniversary of creation of human beings, that is really the beginning of God's creation. Because before we were created, the world is meaningless. We are the ones who give substance and significance to the world around us. And that's something that should give us tremendous chizuk and confidence that the world was created for you and for you and for you. This is perhaps, Rav Soloveitchik explained, um, why we call the confession from the farm, why do we call that vidui meiser? Right? If he's saying that he did everything perfectly. So Rav Soloveitchik explained that over the course of this process, we have to engage in a process of vidui. What is vidui? It comes from the word hodar, to be moded, to recognize. Right? When you, when you give hakar satov and hodar, 
It's you're recognizing the fact that somebody did something for you. But vidui in this context means that you kind of you recognize something different and something new about yourself that maybe you didn't realize before. That's why every single year we are la'arve ha-satan. We don't blow the show for Rosh Hashanah, right? Because we want to confuse the satan. And uh, we blow the show for twice on Rosh Hashanah, one set before Musaf, one set during Musaf, to confuse the satan. What, the satan didn't figure it out from last year? So I once heard because, right, every, the satan, one understanding of the satan is the satan is the eight Sahara within every single person. And so every single year we're dealing with a different satan. And there's a different challenge that you're going through. And there's a different situation. That is that has presented itself to you, and so um, so when you when you do vidui, it's recognizing a whole new dimension of who you are, and then this has to operate on two different levels to be successful in in the Yamuna Raya. The first level is to recognize where you've fallen short, right? There's things that you did incorrect. Certainly, that's a key part. That's the classic vidui that we do ten times over the course of Yom Kippur. And that's certainly important. But if a person only focuses on that, if you just focus on where you fell short and what you did wrong, then you might come to think that you're not worthy. I don't have the ability to turn it around. Who are you kidding? You're going to start to go to Minyan. Who are you kidding? You're not going to keep that up. You're going to start to make brachas. You're going to start to have kavana. What are your friends going to say? What are my friends going to say? And I can't keep this up. So if you just focus on the, on the sins, on the averos, so then how are you going to turn it around? And so that's why Chazal called what the farmer says also a vidui. Vidui means to recognize who you are. Yes, the classic form of vidui in the context of Yom Kippur is seeing where you've fallen short. But also another dimension of vidui is where you, you were successful. That's also something that you have to pay attention to over the course of the Yom Narayim. Yes, think about the times where, you know, of course, the, the, the times where you fell short and the things where you're not getting it right and try to take it up and not try to improve. But also think about your strengths. Think about what you're doing correctly. And think about also, and that what's, you know, think about, you know, that there was a challenging situation and I was able to be persistent and I was able to be determined. And this past year, or whenever it was in the past, I was able to be successful. Think about those times that you were able to do the mitzvah, even when difficult. When you were able to make a Kiddush Hashem at work. When you were able to go out of your way for a family member or a friend. Think about that chesed. Think about that, that mitzvah that you did. And if you were able to do it right then, if like the farmer, and the farmer was able to do it perfectly, that's also a vidui. That's recognizing a new dimension of yourself, not of where you've fallen short, but where you were successful. And if you were able to be successful in those situations, that'll give you the confidence and the chizuk that you can be successful in the future. And that takes us back to how we reach Simcha on Yom Kippur, right? That um, if you realize that you have a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that we're Am Yisra, and you realize that we're the ones who give substance and significance to the entire world, so much so that before we were created, that wasn't even God's creation yet. We describe Rosh Hashanah as the first day of creation. And number three, if you think about the times you got it right and the mitzvahs that you were able to achieve, and the fact that you came out on a Tuesday night, what night is it? On a Tuesday night, where there was nothing else going on, right? No other, no, nothing on Netflix. None of you watch Netflix, of course. But nothing going on, so you're here. Yes, there's so many other things going on. But you got it right for coming here try to be inspired, to try to grow a little bit. And so that's how we have Simcha on the sacred day of Yom Kippur, where we, have, where we kind of regain a sense of confidence of who we are, that we're a case in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that, yes, that the world has a king, and the king has a people, and the, and the kingdom has a law, and you have to follow the law. But Baruch Hashem, the Malkeinu is Avinu, the king is our father, and he's a king of mercy who's going to take us by the hand, and everything's going to be fine. And you have the apple, and you dip it in the honey on Rosh Hashanah, and we're dipping the challah right throughout the course of these days in honey, 
right? And it always fights at the table, right? Which challah to put the honey on, which challah not to put the honey on. And there's no way to avoid the stickiness of the honey. It's just impossible. It gets on the knife, on, gets on your hand, gets on everything. But that's the honey. What's the apple and the honey? What's the idea behind that? The idea behind that, the apple perhaps is associated with the sin of eating of the fruit in Gan Eden. And there's no Jewish source that says it was an apple. It was either probably a grape or a fig or an esrog, but, but it was a fruit. So it's possible that it was an apple. Um, and so the apple perhaps is associated with the sin of eating from the, from the tree. And what we say is that we could rise from the sin. We could rise from the setback. Like Avram Vayashke and Avram Baboker, every single time, it's a disappointment when it says that he woke up in the morning. Rabbi Majeski was, uh, that was great about the alarm clock. And we hit that snooze button. And uh, so, why does it tell us that Avram woke up in the morning? Every single time, you'll see, I think it's three times, it, it's, it's a disappointment where he has to banish Yishmael, which is very upsetting to him, or he's asked to offer Yitzchak, or he prays for Sodom and his prayers are not accepted seemingly they don't make a difference and each time what happens when you're disappointed right you want to uh, you want to maybe sleep in you don't want to get up right he's able to rise from the setback he's able to take the apple and dip it in the honey and so the apple is the setback is the sin and we say that that's not the end that we could learn from the sin we have a lot of mitzvahs that we've done and what's the, the, what's the honey? The honey is the sweetness of Hashem's mercy, but also the fact that within each of you, within each of us, we have the ability, we have the talents, we have the abilities, we have, we have, we have the Torah and mitzvos, and the love of Hashem and the love of others to be able to make better decisions in the future. A couple of stories to, to end off, a couple of, uh, couple of minutes, we're running out of time, but um, Levius of, of Radichev, Belevi Yitzhak of uh, you have to mention him, you have to mention him at some point over the course of the Yom and Narayim because he was the great defender of the people of Israel. And it once happened, the story is told about Rav Levi Yitzchak, that he ascended to the heavenly court. And he saw, and he saw that there was, uh, the Satan was arranging all the bags, a small bag of mitzvot, and bags and bags of sins. When the Satan and his cohort went out, to get uh, some more bags of, uh, of sins, of the sins of Am Yisrael. So quickly, Rav Levi Yitzhak understood that this is a dire moment. This is a very serious situation. And what he does is he goes, he takes the bags of sins, and he, and he goes and he, and he steals them and he throws them out. Satan comes back, sees what happened, and he's all upset. A year's worth of research and all his merchandise was stolen. Grabs Rav Levi Yitzhak by his coat. Is Bekasha takes him to the court and he accuses them of stealing. The heavenly court determines that he is guilty of theft and he has to be sold as a slave. Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, all the tzaddikim, try to redeem Rav Levi Yitzchak, the story goes. But each time the Satan would outbid, would outbid Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, he would outbid all the tzaddikim. Finally, HaKadosh Baruch Hu B'chvodu V'atzmo said, the whole world is mine. I bid the highest price. And I acquire of Levi Yitzchak as my servant. This is the meaning of the line in the Lekel Orechtin, Lekone Avadov Badin. He, God acquires his servants through judgment. And that's what happened. God acquired of Levi Yitzchak to be his servant. And the people of Israel were judged with a favorable, favorable judgment because of the actions of Rav Levi Yitzchak of Radichev. And it's a touching story that number one shows that we should, we should emulate Rav Levi Yitzchak to try to see the good in other people, the sweetness in other people. Kal Yisrael Aravim Zebazeh, not just responsible, but we should be sweet uh, to one another. And we should try to see each other and judge, uh, judge one another favorably. But also I learned from this story the power that we have. Sometimes we don't realize that our tefillos can make such a difference. We don't. We sometimes underestimate our Beit Anul Makom, the Heishmei Rabbas and the Tefillos that we recite, and certainly we should not underestimate Beit Anul Makom or Beit Anul Chaveiro. And Rav Levi Yitzchak understood his capability with humility, and so he said, "This is up to me. I have to take ownership of the situation to help Klal Yisrael." And that's what gives us a sense of simcha 
is we realize that we have greatness. We can live lives of nobility. We can actually, as good as we are, we could, we could get even better. Pablo Casal, the greatest uh, cellist, greatest cellist of the previous generation, who practiced six to eight hours a day, they said to him, Pablo, you're, you're such a great the cellist. Why do you practice so many hours? He said, because I think I can get better. And uh, that's, why, um, that's why we could ask for more in the Shman Esrei. That explains why Rosh Hashanah is really the beginning because the whole world was created for you. And this is why the Vidu is because we also have to think about not just our Averos, that's also important to think about and improve, but to think about where you're getting it right, the mitzvahs that you're doing, and to never forget that, and to keep doing those mitzvahs, and to strengthen, strengthen those mitzvahs, because you could also, like Rav Levi Yitzchel make a difference. The Rav Shem Tov told Rav Nachum of Chernobyl, and I'll end with this, uh, with this story, uh, he said, I want you to collect money for, for chassan and kalas, 10 chassan and kalas. And he sent them from uh, Russia to Poland, which where there was a little more wealth in Poland. And uh, he goes, Rav Nachum Chernobyl goes, and he, it's a true story, and he cannot collect, he's knocking on doors and he's not successful. And, and he finally sits down, he sits down, and he says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if I'm collecting if I'm collecting for myself, then I understand. But I'm not collecting for myself. I'm collecting for brides and grooms in Israel. So please, can you help me? At that moment, he sees two policemen. And they're, they just arrested a man, a Jewish man, seems to be. And the man is dancing, and he's, and he's happy, but he was just arrested by these two policemen. And, uh, Rav, and so this man says to this uh, Rav Nachum of Chernobyl, who's sitting there dejected on the side, he says, do you know who I am? No, I don't know who you are. I'm Moshe the Ganov. I'm Moshe the thief. He's saying this with the policeman holding him. I'm Moshe the Ganov. You don't know who I am? I'm the great thief. No, I don't know who you are, Rav Nachum says to him. Uh, but you're obviously not that good at what you do if you've been arrested by policemen. And I hope also that when you get out of prison, that please, Moshe, when you get out of prison, you should stop doing, you know, you should improve your ways. And the man said to him, Moshe says to Rav Nachum of Chernobyl, he says, Rabbi, don't you understand? A Jew never stops doing what he needs to do. Suddenly Rav Nachum jumps up. He says, oh my gosh. Whoa, you're right. I mean, you're saying that for Averos, that of course we don't do Averos, but I'm doing mitzvahs now. I can't stop doing the mitzvah that I'm doing. And he jumps up, he starts going to all the different homes, and he's able to collect all the tzedakah. He comes back to the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov opens the door and sees him. Rav Nachum says, I was able to collect all the money. You won't believe what happened. Baal Shem Tov, before he hears anything else, he says to Rav Nachum, Rav Nachum, how does Eliyahu look when he's dancing between two policemen? So that's my message to you, Yom Kippur. Yes, think about maybe things that you can improve. Think about things you're doing wrong. But also my message here is to tell you, for all, most of what you keep doing, what you're doing, your commitment to family, to community, to mitzvos. Uh, think about those mitzvos, the challenges from this past year that you've been able to overcome. Uh, focus on that as well. Keep doing what you're doing. Never stop. If something is an important goal, set those goals. Think about what steps you need to take to achieve it. And keep doing what you're doing. A Jew never stops doing what he or she needs to do. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Top. That was phenomenal. Big Yashikayach, a lot to think about and a lot to process. Um, from Rabbi Kalman, we go to Rabbi Kalman's son. Um, our dear friend, Rabbi Yekasil Kalmanson, uh, so much part of Mayan for so many years, davened here and sang here and gave so much life and spoke here quite a few times. So it's a big honor, and he's a very dear friend of mine. It's a big ashakayach, Rabbi Yekasil Kalmanson. Rabbi of Beis Samedrish of Hancock Park.
Merci. Okay, um, hard, to, hard acts to follow, thank God, Rabbi Trapp, Rabbi Majeski. They say the story of a 98-year-old Yemenite Yid. Now, the Yemenites were renowned for their longevity. They had incredible genes and their lifestyle. This 98-year-old Yemenite Yid comes to a doctor. The doctor asks him, what's your secret to your longevity? Tell me, what do you do? What do you eat? What's your regimen? And he says, I golf every morning and I have a little schnapps. Come on, the doctor says. It's got to be your genes. He says, well, my father's 120. The doctor says, no, I don't believe it. He says, yeah. The doctor says, he golfed with you this morning? He says, no, this morning... He actually got married. <laughs> Doctor says, what do you mean he got married? That's ridiculous. I, so, he says, he agrees, but his parents were putting pressure. <laughs> 120 is the amount of years that Rabbi Akiva, the legendary comforter of Kal Yisrael, lived to be 120, and his yard site is actually on Yom Kippur. 135 years after the Common Era, Rabbi Akiva ended his life with at 120. And tonight I want to share with you one of the enduring, empowering, and remarkable lessons of Rabbi Akiva that completely trailblazed the entire institution of Chuba. Well, let's start for a moment from the beginning. We know the Gemara tells us that these days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are referred to in the Psukim as Dirshu Hashem Behimatsai Krauhu Biyaisai Kara. Translated as Seek out God, He will be found, and call out to Him as He is near. Now, at face value, these words, this compilation would seem to be redundant, a little bit repetitive. In fact, the entire tshuva process at times seems repetitive. We know Rav Sadia Gain that's brought down, he would engage in tshuva every single day. The Rebbe Rashab once told the Friedeke Rebbe, right after Yom Kippur, he said in Yiddish, it's their darfman erish tshuva tan. Now we really have to do tshuva. So what is the obsession with the repetitive nature and this ongoing dynamic that tshuva poses in our lives? There's a beautiful medrash I want to share with you. The medrash Tehillim, Mizmar Pehe says, that the Jewish people approach Hashem and we say, you tell us to do tshuva, but we are actually going to tell you, you return. Yisrael, Aymram Lach, Shuv Ata Batrila, God, in essence, we're saying it's impossible for us to embark on this ambitious and unnatural process for us to rid ourselves from the evil inclination, which would seem to be more powerful than us. You have to come close first. And that's what the Pasuk refers to when it says, Shuvah Hashem. The Medrash is saying that we're telling God, you have to take the first step. It's not possible. For us in our finitude, with our limitations, to take that step. Hashem retorts, Loi, he el ashuva Yisrael batchila. Hashem flips it around and says, You have to return. What's the pshara? Loi ata tashiv la atzmacha, but loi anu nashiv la atzmenu, ela shaninu keachad, 
We'll do it together, as the Pasuk says, Shuvenu Elokei Yishenu. Hashem says this is a process that's going to be collected. It'll be unified. We're both going to take a step forward. You're going to take a step forward, and then I'm going to take a step forward, and then somehow the magic will happen. What's the dialogue? What's really going on here? In a sense, we can understand the Jewish people's claim. The Yetzirah that you gave us, the Gemara says, is enough to kill us. How can we contend with an entity that is so powerful and it truly has divine attributes? The Baal Shem Tov says that the reason we say Hashem knew that we sinned and we don't say I sinned is because in essence we're telling Hashem how is it possible for us to stray? It's the Yetzirah that you created, that you put in our path to tempt us, to seduce us, to lead us astray. And only because of this divine power that you invested in the Yetzahara do we sin again and again. Asham knew we have sinned. It's not just us. So Hashem says, I want you to take the first step. The Magan Avram says in a very cryptic statement in Simon Tafkuf Behe that he quotes a story that there was a Balkekea who at one point tried to blow from the shoifer and shul, was not able to emit the sound. He took the shoifer and in the wide end of the shoifer's hole whispered, and then subsequently when he blew, the sound came out. And Tolna Rebbe explains, why did he say the Hinoyam? Why didn't he say any other Psukim which refer to the Shefer blowing? The Hinoyam is a Pasuk in Tehillim, Perak Tzadik, there's Psukim in Tehillim, Piku Bachay de Shefer, in Memzayan, Peidalet, because the Pasuk the Hinoyam refers to the Jewish people trying to build the Mishkan in which they did everything that they were able to do, but ultimately it would not stand and it would not be erected, and Hashem had to endow their efforts with a divine supernatural injection and only after that did the Mishkan arise. Hashem could have brought down the Mishkan like Taisus says is going to happen with the third base of Migdash. It's going to come straight down from heaven, Taisus and Masach the Sukkah. But Hashem didn't want that with the Mishkan. He wanted us to take the first step forward and then he would subsequently bless our efforts. So this year trying to blow the shaifer whispers that pasuk because that's the secret, the magical recipe. When we try to blow and it's not coming out, he says, Hashem, you already told us that you're going to bless our efforts. And after saying that pasuk, the sand came out. There's a beautiful Shem Shmuel. He was quoted once tonight already. The Sachachav Rebbe, the son of the Avnei Nezer, the grandson of the Katzka Rebbe. And the Shem Shmuel quotes the Gemara on Rosh Hashanah and Daphne Zion, which says that when Hashem in the liturgy says, Mava Rishin Rishin, he passes the sins over. If you pay close attention to the words, it doesn't say that he eradicates the sin or erases the sin. He passes it over. He puts it on the side in storage, as it were. If we emerge with a clean slate and we don't sin again, and we're not going to be repeat offenders, and it remains in storage. But if we do sin again, and the side of sin on the scale outweighs the sign of merit, then he takes all the sins out from storage, and he allows it to pile on top. So the Shem Shmuel says, it's obvious if that's what Hashem does in the negative domain, that he's obviously doing the same with tshuva, with our positive actions, and he tallies every hir hur tshuva, every moment in time that we thought about doing the right thing, that we felt a kernel of remorse and regret, even if it didn't translate into a transformation in our behavioral lifestyle. But that kernel of remorse, that feeling of regret, however fleeting and temporal it may have been, he puts it aside. And he's going to tally it up in our favor. I want to share with you briefly a story that I heard several weeks ago. There was a from yeshiva student who grew up in a very ultra-Orthodox family in Bnei Brak. He rebelled. 
he left his family and he went to Tel Aviv to a relative who is secular. But he even outdid his secular relatives, and he, after four years of wandering, got engaged to a Gentile woman. His father invites him to come back to Bnei Brak for a Shabbos. He pleasures his father, and he comes back for a Shabbos, even though he tells his father, I'm not changing. I'm not going to break off the engagement, but I'll humor you. Friday night, at the meal, at the Shabbos meal in Bnei Brak, he goes to the porch, he takes out a cigarette, openly violating Shabbos. Father doesn't lose his cool, welcomes him back to the table. After the meal, his father says, I'm going to go to Rav Steinman, Zechot Tzadok Levracha's tape, his tish, his house. He shares some terror Friday night. Do you care to join me? He says, yeah, I'll join you. They go to Rav Steinman, and after Rav Steinman finishes speaking, the father takes his son to wish Rav Steinman good Shabbos and then tells Rav Steinman, this is my son who's engaged to a shiksa. Steinman, unfazed, looks at this boy with only love in his eyes. And he says, tell me, how many years is it since you went off the path of Torah Mitzvahs? He says, four years. He says, in those four years, have you ever had a hear her tshuva? Did you ever feel a kernel of remorse, a fleeting moment of regret? He thinks. He says, yes. There were five times that I felt that. How long did they last? He says, between 10 and 20 minutes. Steinman says, wow, I am so Jealous of you. Ich bin der Mekana. I never had a feeling of charata. I never had a hear her tshuva the way you did. Over an hour. He walks away, turns to his father, and he says, I'm breaking off the engagement. Sometime later, the father says, I know why Rav Steinman's words penetrated and inspired you. But what I don't understand is why you agreed to come with me to Rav Steinman's tish, this Friday night table. You were so full of anger. He said, because many, many years ago, before Rav Steinman became the God of the Israel that he was, he came to test us in school and farher us and test us on the information on our studies. And I didn't learn. I didn't know. And he asked everybody to translate a pasuk, to ask them a question, and he gave them a candy. And when he asked me once, and I didn't know, he tried coming up with an even simpler, more elementary question, so he can give me the candy. I didn't know. He asked me a third question, of the most basic of questions. Even that, I didn't know. All the kids left the classroom. He called me behind, and he said, Tyra is not only judged by knowledge and results, it is also celebrated by the effort that you invest. You try to answer my questions three times, and here's three candies for your efforts. That was his memory of Steinman, and that was why he agreed to go with his father to the Tish that Friday night, even though he was so full of rage and anger. Tallying up those moments of hear her tshuva, is what the Shem Shmuel says, is what Hashem does. As the counterpart to Mavarish and Rishon, Hashem counts and celebrates and views with so much importance every moment of tshuva. Because even one step, Hashem says, I got you. You just have to seek me out, but I'm waiting to be found. Hirshu Hashem bihi matzai. And the Rebbe in Asicha explains, He's waiting to be found. The word mitziah, the Gemara explains, is refers to somebody who finds a $100 bill in their pants pocket. It's completely disproportionate to the effort that you invest. The amount of divine favor that we experience by even seeking them out and taking one step forward is completely disproportionate to the effort that we invest. 
It's like winning the lottery. You know what happens when you win the lottery? Say the story of somebody who won the lottery once, and the reporters are asking, what are you going to do with all this money? And he says, I'll probably pay my debts off. The reporter says, yeah, but what about the rest? He says, the rest will have to wait. But other people, when they win the lottery, more often than not, they squander it. Because great success sometimes leads to reckless and self-sabotaging behavior. I'll give you a few examples. The Noah syndrome. Noah, after heroically taking his family through the 12 months in the Teva with all the animals in the world, emerges from that experience. He succeeded. The apex of his success. And then he gets drunk and terrible things happen. Somebody achieves the climax of their career. That's where a mid midlife crisis comes in. People make aliyah. And then sometime later, they feel bereft of the spirituality of Eretz Yisrael. Somebody becomes a balchuva, And they stop finding the same rich meaning and purpose in Yiddishkeit that they found originally. And that's where the second half of the puzzle comes in. Karu bihiyayse karev. And we turn to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, whose yard site was on Yom Kippur, taught a magnificent teaching in the end of Masech the Yuma. Masech the Yuma is replete with all the intricate rituals of the day, the Tzvilas, the Hazaz, the Karbanas, and then the Beis Hamidrash was destroyed. And Rabbi Akiva, the legendary comforter of Klal Yisrael, says a teaching to placate and comfort Klai Yisrael that they'll be able to retain a level of closeness with Hashem even post Churban. And he says the famous words, Ma mikvah metaras etzmeim, afa kadosh baruch hu metaras Yisrael. Ma mikvah metaras etzmeim. Just like the mikvah purifies, the impure, so too, tshuva, Hashem says, will purify the Jewish people. That seems very, very elementary. Rabbi Kiva began, begins the statement with a lot of fanfare. He says, Ashrechem Yisrael, you are so fortunate. You're so lucky. He's about to shew with you a pearl of wisdom that nobody knows. And then he proceeds to say something that sounds incredibly elementary. You ever hear somebody quote their wise great-grandfather and say, you know, as my great-grandfather used to say, it is what it is. Not your great grandfather. Jackie Mason says that the Jewish husband gets stuck on the car. They pull over him and his wife, and she says, Go see what's going on. He goes out to the car, and uh, five minutes later, he comes back in, and the wife says, New, no. with the knowing look, he tells her, I think it's something under the hood. Rabbi Kiva is saying, Chuba is Matar. What, what is he saying? Ma mikva Matar es if you had to take one of those words out, it would be the word esatmeim. Ma mikva metar. Mikva purifies. Obviously, we're dealing with somebody who's tummy. So the Rebbe explains in the Sicha that there is an incredibly profound message here that Rabbi Kiva is referring to. There are various degrees of impurity. For example, if somebody touches a rodent, they only become impure for 24 hours. If somebody touches a corpse, they become impure for seven days. So what happens if somebody touches a rodent and they touch a corpse? When do they go to mikvah? You would think, wait seven days. Even though you're tame for touching the rodent, which lasts only 24 hours, but why should you go to the mikvah if you're anyway impure on account of touching the corpse? But the halacha is not that way. The halacha, in fact, is that you go to the mikvah after 24 hours, even though you will remain impure on account of the greater, more severe impurity. 
because every degree of impurity that one can remove from themselves is precious, is celebrated, and cherished by Hashem. And that, the Rebbe says, is what Rabbi Kiva is referring to. Even somebody who's going to remain tame after they go to the mikvah, that is still someone who has to engage in the process of tshuva because every step is powerful and necessary and vital. And nobody better than Rabbi Kiva was able to experientially convey that piece of wisdom. Why did Rabbi Kiva decide to become who he was? What inspired him to become a Talmud Chacham? Even though he was a boor, and even though he was an ignoramus at age 40, the drip drop of water every single day, seeing that something as weak and benign as water, after the consecutive, progressive, constant drip drop, was able to penetrate even something as coarse and as hard as a rock, and he said, obviously, I can be inspired and can be transformed and can be enveloped in the wisdom and the purity and the holiness of the Torah. Every degree of impurity that one can remove from himself is powerful. And that's the second half of the Pasuk, Kura'u Karav. Taking this one step further, it's so easy after Rosh Hashanah to feel so holy and then be hit with a taiva, with a desire, with a temptation and say, it was all for naught. Somebody achieves a powerful time of sobriety and then they relapse. And the natural inclination and thought process is everything I did was a waste of time. It was for naught. You win the lottery. You find God. How could it be that I'm so coarse and I'm so distant even after I found the truth? And it causes us to engage in self-doubt. And that is where Karu B'yayisikarov comes in. You find truth once, but we spend a lifetime comprehending, probing, and ultimately owning that truth. That's karuhu biyoyse karev. You call out. It's a conversation. It's an ongoing conversation. For any of you who know the slopes, the difference between skiing and snowboarding. Snowboarding is hard to master, hard to, is hard to pick up and easy to master, and skiing is easy to pick up and hard to master. That's the process of tshuva. Say the story with the fellow who comes to a bar and he's, he's a nun preaching about the dangers of drinking and how terrible it is and what a vice it is. And he goes over to the nun. He says, tell me something. Have you ever had a drink? She says, no. He says, let me buy you a drink. She says, if you must, give me a 40-year Macallan, but put it in a teacup so nobody should know that I'm drinking. He goes to the bartender and he says, can I have some 40-year Macallan in a teacup? Bartender looks at him and he says, don't tell me the nun is here again. <laughs> Much like the nun, tshuva is an ongoing process. Even when we're still tame, even though we know that we're going to be plagued with temptation, with desire, with the same struggles, to talk Lashon Hara, to not come to Minyan, to not learn when we're supposed to, to not show up as the father, as the husband, as the child that we're supposed to. It's an ongoing process, but Hashem wants you to engage in it every step of the way because it's celebrated and it's precious. And I want to conclude with one story. Rabbi Tursky, Rabbi Dr. Tursky, was once talking to an alcoholic woman. And in the conversation, she mentioned that she's a passionate fan of the Jets. And she watches every game. And even when she can't watch the game, she has somebody record the game. And she remarked that once, some weeks ago, her friend recorded the game. This is back in the day where you had to record it with a whole device. And when her friend handed her the cassette, she casually, haphazardly remarked, oh, by the way, the Jets won. So Rabbi Tursky looks at her and says, did that ruin the experience for you? 
She says, on the contrary, it elevated the experience. And that game was a better watch than any other game. He says, what do you mean? He says, well, in the middle of the game, the Jets were down by 20 points. And under regular circumstances, I would have been a nervous wreck, anxious, going to the kitchen for comfort food. But I watched it with serenity. And I was able to maintain my equilibrium because I knew that the Jets were going to win. And so the message of Rabbi Kiva, whose yard site is Yom Kippur, whose message of tshuva is the ultimate comfort even after the base of Megdash was destroyed, what Yom Kippur could do. Yom Kippur really personifying and embodying his lasting legacy is ma mikvah metaras at even if we're going to remain tame, we're going to have our ups, we're going to have our downs, we're going to have our trials and tribulations. And sometimes it may seem that Team that our team is down by 20 points. We know that Hashem knows that ultimately our team is going to win. Thank you, Rabbi Collins, and that was Gavaldic. Thank you. So much, so much to think about, so much light tonight, so much bracha. Let me just leave you with some, some lasting thoughts. Hopefully it'll be meaningful if you still hang around for a couple of moments. So uh, the Balshemtov once came to a town and he met, um, he asked the people in the town, he asked, who is the chazan, who is the cantor on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur? So he said, our rabbi, he's an amazing voice. He talks beautifully. So the Balshemtev asked him, so how does he recite the Vidoy? What's the tune that he sings? So Rabbi, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Tapifo was singing before. And that's the, tra the traditional song. Yeah, 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 right? Um, and it's, 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 you know, he was asking on the fact that we're singing, but it's like, okay, it's a song that's, that uh, is not the most Lebediga song, if you might say, most Prelacha song, most happy song. But this, these people started singing the tune that this rabbi sings, and it was like an enormously joyous song, a very, very freilich song. And um, the uh, and obviously, so the Balshemta said, call me the rabbi. And it was so, so inappropriate, because you're standing and you're, you're, you're doing a shamnu bagadnu, you're saying al khait, and you're, and, and you're singing uh, such, a, such a happy tune. So uh, when I grew up in this... Uh, I have over here, uh, she's still here, crazy. Any case, I grew up in Stachin. And the Stachin Rebbe, the Stachin where I grew up, they would sing Davka, a very happy song, and during in the Sana Tokev. By me, Yichia, me, Yamas. When everybody's in dread, like who's going to buy fire, who buy water, who buy this, the whole place would clap. It was like the half, it was a way, I guess, of mito kadinim, of, of sweetening the, the judgment. It was very powerful. I remember growing up with that. Um, I missed that. Um, but in any case, he would sing a very frail chatun. So the, the Baal Shem Tev asked him, what's this business? People are, 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 are confronting their darkest, uh, you know, their darkest uh, actions, their aspects of their life, that there's nothing to be proud of in your singing. And the person said, well, I'll tell you, you know, years ago I visited the czar, I visited the palace, and I, and I was watching, you know, everything that was going on in the palace. It was really, 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 outstanding you know so many servants of the of the of the, of the, of the czar of the king so many servants you have the the people that 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 uh, serve the food and you have the kitchen staff and you have the landscapers and you have the people that are part of the of the of the of the of the of the, of the, uh, the royal orchestra and so on and so forth and then as i was walking outside strolling around i hear someone singing a very very happy tune and I was wondering, where's the sound coming from? It sounds like a person himself, and I was curious. And, and I realized I'm standing right next to the stable. So I looked in, into the crack of the stable, and I see this fellow. He's one of the servants, and he's, he's, he's standing there with a rake, and he's raking all the dung that's in the stable. He's sweeping the stable. And it was such a terrible stench. It was horrible. And yet he was singing such a happy tune, like he's the happiest guy. And I was like wondering that that's such a strange thing. I mean, you kind of, 
You're dealing with such a terrible stench and it's such an unpleasant type of place to be in. Why is he so happy? And I watched for a while and then I couldn't control myself and I knocked on the door and he opened up and I said to him, hey, Jose, whatever his name was, wasn't Jose there in, in, in Russia. He says, Vladimir, what are you doing over here? You're singing like this. He said, he said don't you understand? He says, from all the people, from all the stables I could have ended up in, <laughs> I ended up being the one who is sweeping, sweeping his majesty's table, stable, and with that he could continue dancing. They said, so then I learned. The question is, whose stable are we cleaning? So we stand in front of Yom Kippur and we're cleaning a stable, it stinks. We face sometimes some not the nice, most pleasant things, but we're cleaning. Like, like Rabbi Kiva said, Rabbi Kalman said, lift me me at the Mitahar and in front of who? Are you, are you cleansing yourself? Who's stable are you cleaning? Whose world is this? Who's this? Who, whose world is getting brighter and cleaner? So if we remain very narrow and small-minded, then we're thinking only of ourselves. And we're thinking of our ugliness and of our darkness, and it's heavy and it's hard. But if we kind of come out of that smallness and we look at, at the greater picture, we see what's beyond. We see that this is, this is Hashem's world. This is Hashem's plan. This is God's project. So really, the question we have tonight is a serious question, because for those of us, I looked at my beard already a little while ago, right? I'm, you know, we progress in life. We move into a point where we've been around many Yom Kippers, and we've done the Osham a lot of times, the al Khaits a lot of times. And we've, when we're younger, we really, really try to make, we stand there, I remember, like you stand tight, and you're like, you try to like in a deep, deep way say you're never going to sin again. Right, but there's a certain point where you, when you get to like the mid 40s, forget about it. You you know it's never, it's it's not true. So you stop even pretending that it's the truth. You stand there, man. As long as you want to be a little true, you know it's not going to happen. I mean, you you definitely are looking to make small increments and improvements, but but you know it's not going to be that you're turning into you know the Baba Sali tomorrow. You know you're not going to be the holy holy tzaddik. You know it's not going to happen. You know you you have your your, 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 whatever they are, addictions, we have our, our, our messy side. And, 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 and yet we do this year after year. So on the one hand, we talk about the little progression. And the little progression is awesome. But what happens if you do look at the year and you don't see that last year you progressed? What kind of feeling do we have when we're coming in Kipper? And we, and actually, maybe the last year you violated we, we crossed certain, certain, a certain line we've never crossed before. What happens if we've been holding on to, to a good conduct for such a long time, and then this past year we dropped it for the first time? Possible. And then what are we coming with Yom Kippur? We're better than the, the year before, not better. And we declined. And, it's, and, and, and then it becomes really heavy and hard and, 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 and to be in the stable and to deal with it. And, 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 and it can be crushing. So really, what's, what's, what's the thought? There's so many approaches we heard tonight. I'd like to give just a, a one, a, a one thought, a, 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 a deep Hasidic approach to all of this, which can really you know, take us out of this, this dark place and lift us up to so much higher. And that is when we look conventionally at the whole process of being of life. What, what are we doing here? What, what's going on? The simple, simple way of understanding things is that God created a world and he wanted to do good. I'm talking about if you get a little, a little more deeper, God wanted to do good. And um, he, he brought the Torah to the world so that he can teach mankind how to really be good and connect to him and give them ultimate goodness. As the explanation goes, shameful bread, if you, you're given all the good without working for it, doesn't feel good. So God gave us Torah and mitzvot and gave us an opportunity. And, kills, and he tells us, I give you a choice of life. To do good, choose life, don't choose death. The Jewish people stood up when all the nations, no one was interested, and we, we took the Torah. And then we are we're now in a state where we, we're given this enormous opportunity that we can connect to God with channels that no one else can. And it's very, very special. And if we do all the good, we will, we will merit Gan Eden and, 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 and good in this world and good in the future. And if we get caught up and get seduced by the external uh, uh, temporal uh, temptations, then we're just a big loser. That's it. So, okay. And then, so we have our Hashem Yom Kippur. We can come, we can make amends, start things over again. That's that's the way that, that, that we sometimes view life. 
uh, the, the Hasidic masters teach us, and you, you, from, the, from the realm of mysticism, we get a, a whole different look. We see the whole thing very differently. Like everything begins with Hashem having a desire. God created a world because he wanted something. Hashem had this deepest, deepest yearning that Hashem wanted to create a world that is extremely dark, extremely oblivious of him, where he's we're full of ignorance, full of distance, full of obstacles, full of... And God wanted that world to get closer to him. And eventually that God should be able to reveal his kingship over the entire world. And that our world should become brighter than heaven. And that the world should radiate with infinite light of goodness and holiness. And that objective, an ultimate objective, is going to be in the time of Mashiach. Now, in the time of Mashiach, right? When Mashiach will come, the world will be filled with incredible light. Every nook and cranny in the earth will be radiating with God's infinity. So that's the ultimate. When God created the world, of course, God couldn't create it extremely dark because God doesn't create any bad. So Hashem created it with enough concealment that he can then take Adam and Chava and set them up for failure. There's no question. By now we can spill the... It wasn't good. They weren't allowed to tell this us 3,000 years ago. But now after 3,000 years, it has been revealed to us that it was a setup. Adam and Chava had very little chances not to sin. And they plunged the world into darkness. And the world was meant to spiral into darkness, darkness, till it couldn't get any darker. And it is so dark and so... And yet from within the darkness, God wants us to transform that darkness into light, and that will give him pleasure. That will give him pleasure. That will give him satisfaction. But how in the world are we going to deal with such darkness? How in the world are we going to overcome, like, like uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Kamasin just said, you know, uh, there is a certain divinity to the forces of darkness. Hashem gave them power. This is real. According to mysticism, they're rooted in the sources of Tohu. Tohu are the are powerful forces that are higher than the world of Tikkun. This is subjects to talk about for months and years. But they're rooted in very, very powerful places. The forces of darkness, the forces of unholiness. There's absolutely no way to take them down other than God himself, who is, who is a kol yachal. Hashem is omnipotent. He can deal with the darkness. That's why there is no other way for the fulfillment of this plan other than Hashem actually inserting himself into this world. And how does God insert himself into this world? Through each and every one of us. We're not human beings we're not earthly beings as the jewish people we're a piece of hashem from above literally it's not just a nice thing to make people feel good this is the truth of our neshama a spark of hashem a spark of hashem as the balshemta says a spark of the essence is the entire essence that's our soul but in order for the soul to be able to impact the world in a very internalized way in a very in a very real way that it has impact in the world not overpowering it from above but kind of like transforming it from the inside, Hashem took that neshama and lowered it down through thousands and thousands, myriads and myriads of contractions until we end up in a human physical body of flesh and blood and we walk around this planet with the spark of Hashem inside of us that is hidden, but it's there. And that's why it has all the power. But in order for our neshama to be able to maintain its connection to God, Hashem opens up 613 channels of Torah and mitzvahs. Through those Torah and mitzvahs, we can download God into the world. We can channel Hashem's light into this world. And every single one of us is given a place in this world that we need to illuminate. And only we can illuminate. And those places that we are sent into are very challenging and very dark and extremely dark, especially if you're coming on the scene like our generation, right before the coming of Mashiach. The leftover dregs of all of existence is what we're facing. And here is where we need to elevate. Here is where we need to permeate divine consciousness. So the world, as we know, the world is very dark out there. And every neshama has its job. So the soul sacrificed itself to come down into this world. We're doing Hashem an enormous favor for coming down into this world. This is not from the ultimate perspective. A soul being a piece of Hashem descending into this world is sacrificing itself for Hashem's pleasure. Imagine a few weeks ago there was the hurricane Hillary. So they made a big deal about it. It was going to be who knows what. Thank God it, it was Bechesed Uberachim. But imagine like at the intensity of it and wherever it was, you send your child out because you need medication. And you send your car, your child out in, with the car to go to the place, the last, the last pharmacy that's the, the, you know, 20 miles away because you, you ran out of medication. And your child, because he loves you, he, you, you so much, gets into that car and goes through the storm. 
And how upset and angry do you get if the car, if the kid, the kid got 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 stuck or scratched the car or got into a little accident? When you realize that your child went out into that situation to sacrifice for you, you're filled with mercy, you're filled with whatever you can do to help your child. God is not angry, Hashem is not upset. Hashem feels for us with infinite compassion and infinite mercy. But it's even deeper than that. We don't realize that Yom Kippur, Hashem needs Yom Kippur more than all of us. Because this is his problem. Do you realize that? This is his problem. You see, he decided to create the world. He decided that he wants to be a king over the world. We are the facilitators of it. Of course, it's our problem as well. But if you're coming at it from a very human down to down to earth perspective, then how important is it? Well, it's as important as my life. My life is dependent on it. I'm going to have a good life. I'm not going to have a good life. But even if you're like super, super important, somebody, this is, you can ascribe a certain value. Just the other day, just yesterday, they, they, they found a plane. They got that 80, I think it was the, the $80 million plane just got lost. They're trying to find the debris, where it came, where it went down. Right? So then what's the value? Okay, there's a value. Okay, it, 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 of course, obviously, because it's our life. It's very, very important to us, but it still has a limited value. But how important is the project if it's God's project? It's as infinite as he is, as boundless as he is. How much does God want to emanate and to reveal his kingdom in this world through each and every one of us? And how many of us does he have? How many Jewish people in the world? They're also one of the things that came out just before Rosh Hashanah. We're close to 16 million Jews from what? From 8 billion people in the planet. These are the unique, these are the, these are the, 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 the seals, the Navy seals that were mentioned earlier that are sent into the most dangerous of places, into Afghanistan to take, or to, into Pakistan to take down bin Laden. Remember that, right? So we're, we're going in. So what do you think? We're going to go into these dark places and you're going to go through. The other day I was hiking somewhere and suddenly the trail became so thin and narrow and with pokey stuff all over. And no matter what, me and my wife were trying to go through it and we were getting poked and poked. It's impossible. And the feet, and you go, it's muddy and your feet are not going to go. What do you think Hashem doesn't know we're going to get muddy and we're going to get sticky stuff all over us? And sometimes our garments are going to get torn? Of course he does. That's why he created Yom Kippur. He wants us to come back to him once a year so he can clean us off. Hashem wants the rotor rooter all these pipes that he needs. You realize, okay, just because, you know, sometimes your, 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 your pipes are clogged. So you call a plumber and to unclog the pipes. And they, but you'll say, well, I know it's going to get clogged again, so I'm not going to leave it. No, now you need, these, you need these pipes unclogged now. And if you're going to have to do it again in a year from now, or you're going to have to repipe, so you're going to do it. But you got, you got to get it going. Hashem needs our souls to be clean. And Hashem needs our pipelines of the 613 commandments that get damaged if we do not learn, we don't observe the Torah properly. Hashem needs that repaired. So he wants us to come to Yom Kippur so that he can repair them for us. So that he can further be revered in this world. So Hashem's light can come into this world. He needs to rewire us. It, it, this is not, I'm not saying this on my own. It's the, the Alter Rebbe says in the Pasuk, we say it, we're going to say it the whole 10 days of tshuva. We say it, uh, with you, God is forgiveness, so that you should be feared. So the old Mepharshim, all the commentators ask, with you, God is the, for, you, you God have forgiveness, that's why you're going to be feared? That's why you won't be feared. Because we know, God forbid, we can get away with it. The sages had a whole problem with tshuva. Because they said the people will take advantage of tshuva. If I know I can sin and then do tshuva, then I'll, then I'll, who cares? They were not afraid to sin because later we'll do tshuva. Or later Yom Kippur will forgive. So the sages have to come up with a whole situation that if you initially calculate that you're going to sin and you're going to do tshuva, it's going to be very hard to do tshuva. Or they, they won't help you do tshuva and Yom Kippur because it's once you have a loophole. So the Mepharshim have a hard time explaining it. They say if the gate would be slammed shut after we sin and we can never repair anything, then what? then we would give up. So therefore, Hashem has to leave it. So therefore, if we know we can do it, we can kind of re re reconnect. That's the explanation. But the Alter Rebbe explains, hear this. He says, Ki imcha aslicha, with you is forgiveness. Why? Because you know, God, that if you don't forgive, Laman tivare, you're out of business. Hashem can shut down tomorrow and I pay so much. 
Hashem can't afford to go out of business now after we've been through all of this right now. There's no going back. We're already at the threshold of Mashiach. There's no going back. There's no starting all over again. You're not going to find a new Moshe Rabbeinu to start it all over again. It's not happening. We're already at that moment. And therefore, there is no chas v'shalom, no way that the project can't be successful. So there needs to be forgiveness. Well, what's our job? Our avoid the is and Yom to show up. To show up to shul and to, with the feeling, with the sense, Eberste. I know, as we discussed in the, earlier, in the earlier talks, I know who I really am. I know my true essence. I am really you. I'm much more than, than, than this little, little peepsqueak person. I'm this godly entity in this world. And that's what we do. The whole Yom Kippur experience is meant to shed. To shed the external identities, the outside of us. We, we kind of disassociate with the body. We, we, we rise into a state of purity. And the five prayers take us deeper and deeper and deeper until we reach Ne'ilah, where we're in a state of Yechida. We're actually back to our soul before it even took on the mission, before it even became a soul. The soul is before it was ever breathed out of God when it's still part of the infinite. That's where we go back to on Yom Kippur. And then we look back down at our mission and we, and we say to Hashem, who we are one with him, and say, listen here, if I'm going back in there, we better repair the tigers over here because I'm not going back with 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 de with, uh, with um deflated tires. I'm not going back if the steering wheel isn't working. I can't go back into this. And of course, lovingly and happily, Hashem picks up every every element. Hashem repairs all the wires. Hashem repairs everything. Gets completely refurbished, and the soul is cleansed and purified with love, with admiration. So, when, but all all we need is when we're coming. We want this. We want to be elevated. So at some point, point, if you're a man, it's easier. If you're wearing a talus, put the talus over your head. A woman, you can take your machzer. And at some, just think deeply. Think deeply who I am, Hashem. I know the truth of my existence. And if a little tear starts coming down your cheek, that in that moment, your soul is completely one with, the, with, with Hashem, completely rejuvenated, completely new. You're a new human being. And now we can start all over again. Now, this doesn't take away responsibility. Oh, this is God's problem. It's not my problem. No. If I know that I'm a piece of Hashem from above and I have this infinite mission, that every little thing in Judaism, every mitzvah, every halacha is infinitely important. It's not just my own private thing that I want to go to Olam Haba. I have to fulfill the mission that God has placed upon me. But on the other hand, we also know that it's part of Hashem's responsibility as well. And he knows the Messiah Snappish, as mentioned earlier. He knows that we sacrificed for him. And in that sense, he helped us in the tshuva process. And Hashem is so excited, so excited when we come on, 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 on Yom Kippur. He is away. He can't wait. The first one in Shul, the hour before everybody's there. Hashem is there counting every person coming in. Who, you're here too. You're here too. Get everybody together. Everybody, Hashem, what? Even before we open our mouth, we're already forgiven. The, 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 the purification, the 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 the, the, uh, the whole ten, the 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 whole five prayers is only to deepen it and deepen it, and we should become more conscious of it, and and so on and so forth. And that and that and that has to be our attitude. And when we know that, when we feel that, well, first of all, we're relaxed. There's no sense. There's a sense of awe. There's a sense. If we would only see, if we could only see the light that is emanating from each and every one of us on your kid. Especially as we move from Mairev to Shachris, to Musa, to Mincha. And then we move from Mincha into Ne'ilah. Wow. We really should not be able, just like in our look at the Kohanim, when they're saying, because the Shekhinah dwells upon them. The amount of Shekhinah radiance that radiates of every single one of them. could be the biggest sinner. But you're in Shul, and you came to participate in Yom Kippur. The amount of godly radiance that's shining on every person is indescribable. And that's why what happens right after Sukkot, immediately, we go live in the Holy of Holies. We go live in, for a week. Imagine that. We couldn't, get, God forbid, ever go into a Sukkot. And here we sit, we eat, and we do this. We, according to Allah, we even sleep in the Sukkah. Like, 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 in the Kodesh HaKadoshim, in the Holy of Holies? And the answer is, after Yom Kippur, when you've completely refer, you've completely opened yourself up again to your divine soul, and your divinity is shining. Of course, you can be, be in the Kodesh Hakadosh. You can be in the holies of holies. 
We all go in with the Kohen Gadol to the Holy of Holies, and then some of the Holy of Holies comes to every, everybody's home. And the Shekhinah dwells in our homes and our sukkah. So, to conclude, Hashem forgives us. That's the bottom line. He's excited to forgive us. He wants to forgive us. He needs to forgive us. And um, we are excited to give him the opportunity to forgive us. And to get back in. And the main point is to go to experience Yom Kippur and then to reinfuse ourselves with such an excitement about our mission. To recognize how much Hashem nachas from us. You know, when the when Jews were in the shtetl, they were in the shtetl. Okay, fine. And it was nice. And we had influence on the world. But you know, imagine the influence and the enjoyment that God has from the people who walk the streets of Hollywood. And over here, illuminate godly light. Do mitzvah. How do you do it? By saying Baruch Hashem and saying a kapitel tehillim and doing a mitzvah and doing a yid of favor and maintaining your godly equilibrium. Or you, you maintain your godliness and you don't sin. You try not to. You know what this does? It's unbelievable, the purification. In such a place that is so un impossible and so unexpected. This creates such a simcha above that's unbelievable. And when we need a little duster, the dust does us off very, very, very happily. Joyfully. So may we merit to have real simcha and real joy and a gemach hasimah to have a good gebench diar and we should manage already to see the revelation of all of our work here down here in the field. Thank you.